In late 2020, I had a problem. With no real idea what to do after graduating and stuck at home due to the pandemic, the options for my future seemed pretty thin. That's when I discovered van life on YouTube, and it got me thinking, hey, wait a minute, could I do that? Could I buy a van, build it out to be my ideal off-grid camper, live full-time on the road, and, at least in the near future, travel across Canada? At the time, it seemed like a long shot. I had never done anything like it before, and it would be a huge investment of time and effort. But I was captivated by the lifestyle and felt pulled in its direction. I figured, with the right amount of planning, it could be possible. So I set my sights on van life, and for the next two years, I thought and planned and planned and planned some more. Now, in December of 2022, I am finally sitting in the van of my dreams. But how did we get here? Hello, I'm Michael. This video goes into depth about the process of converting my Ram Pro Master 3500 from this to this. I'm thrilled to show you how this van was built because it has evolved into more than just a vehicle. It's now my ticket to a whole new way of living. So without further ado, let's get started. If you read online about how to get started planning a van build, many sites will first tell you to ask yourself, what do I really need to live comfortably to get a clear idea of what your needs are? For me, my vision was to create a camper that could support the kind of journey I wanted to go on. So after some consideration, I narrowed down my needs to running water with a capacity large enough to be used for drinking, cooking, and cleaning, a way to cook and store fresh food, electricity with a battery large enough for my needs, methods of climate control, a toilet, the ability to stand up in the van, and a bed. Immediately, this narrowed down my options on vehicles. I would either need a van like a Chevy Express with an added high top, a box truck, or a typical cargo van like a ProMaster Sprinter or Transit. Although I'm sure that many, if not most, would-be van lifers experience this back and forth, in the end, I decided to save up and buy a ProMaster. After making my decision, I looked at van layouts, tours, and build videos to educate myself on what other people had been doing and see what aspects of typical builds I liked. From watching these videos, I learned a great deal about what would make a good layout for me, and I eventually decided on and sketched my floor plan. With the floor plan of my layout created and the assistance of my talented brother John, we set out to design and model the complete build in Fusion 360 so that it could be used as a reference when building. To properly design a space I was happy with, we worked on this scale model piece by piece for more than a year, figuring out all the small details, not just where things would be, but how big they were and how they fit in with other things in the van, all while considering how practical the design was for living in. I truly can't express my gratitude to John enough. Similarly, my dad also played a key role in this build. Every van build needs an old man, and he's right about that. At the same time we were designing and modeling the interior, I was also creating a thorough budget breakdown for the full build, which was a difficult process. I pieced together practically everything I would need for the project over the course of several months into one spreadsheet, complete with prices and links for each item as well as a description of what they were and what they were used for. All of this serious planning started in late 2020, but I wasn't able to purchase the van until March of 2022. I bought a used 2015 Ram Pro Master 3500 159 wheelbase. Before I got it, it had 260,000 kilometers on it and had been used as a delivery van. I paid 40,000 Canadian for it, which was a great deal in the then horribly overpriced used car market. And on that day, after two years of thinking, planning, and dreaming, the build could finally begin. The joy and relief I felt was immense. After bringing it home, the first step was to remove the corrugated plastic on the walls and ceiling, as well as the really beat up plastic floor. The walls and ceiling were easy, but the bolts holding the floor to the van proved to be more difficult. Removing the floor, I was greeted with this. But after some sweeping, it looked like this. The first step in most van builds is to add sound ending to the major areas of the van, and mine was no different in this aspect. Here's what the wheel well sounded like before and after. The difference in loudness is slight in the video, but the more noticeable effect is in the reduced reverberation. 
Next, we framed out the floor and cut the insulation out for it. I used 1 inch XPS insulation and filled all the gaps with spray foam, but we didn't secure it all down before I scrubbed all the rust off of the floor and sprayed it with rust -Oleum. Then it was time for the first cut in the body of the van. Singing a drill bit into the perfectly good wall of your brand new van is a horrible experience, but there's only one way to get a window on these bad boys, so it had to be done. Yep, that's a hole, all right. We quickly filed the rough edges, then sprayed with Rust-Oleum, and it was ready for the window. Securing the window after all that was pretty simple. One person holds it in place, while the other screws it in from the other side. And she's done. I positioned this window to be right above the level of the bed. Next was the larger window on the other side. This would become the dining area window. I broke off the wall beam as it was in the way, and we drilled and jigsawed another hole in the wall. Beautiful. This window, however, had a problem. Due to how it was designed and the thinness of the van walls, we needed a spacer to allow it to be cinched properly to the wall. One quick cut from the jigsaw and it fit in nicely. With both of the windows now completed, I moved on to adding the final layers of sound deadening. This is Noiko Red that I'm putting up on the walls here. It's a dual thermo and sound insulator. I figured if the walls were going up soon, I should take my last opportunity to get as much sound isolation as possible. Here's what it looked like when it was finished. Next, another hole needed to be cut for the ceiling fan. I went with a Max Air Fan because they're pretty much the only viable option on the market, but I think it's a really poorly designed and overpriced machine. It gets the job done and ventilation is something you definitely need in a build, but if there were better options out there, I'd never consider using it. As you can see, here we're using an angle grinder to cut the metal of the roof. I would wholeheartedly recommend against doing this and instead use a good metal cutting bit on a jigsaw. This ended up flinging a bunch of metal shards all over the roof that had to be cleaned up later. And if I hadn't secured a cardboard box on the inside of the ceiling where we cut, it would have been much worse. Anyway, with the whole cut, we installed the fan. And wow, those screws sure look safe, don't they? The next step we decided to focus on was the electrical system. Simply because it was essential to the entire build operating, and if we couldn't get that running smoothly, well, nothing else mattered. The electrical build is often dreaded by DIY van lifers, and there's good reasoning why. If you're like me and don't know more than the basics of how electricity works before you start your electrical planning, it can get confusing extremely quickly. Even though now I have successfully completed the electrical install in the van, I'm really not the best person to explain the ins and outs to you. I owe the success of my electrical build to Explorers.life. His videos and diagrams were a lifesaver for me and they genuinely gave me much more confidence going into my electrical build than I would have had otherwise. Links to his YouTube channel and website in the description of this video. If electrical systems seem daunting to you, that's an excellent place to start. Regardless, here's a brief overview of what my electrical build looks like. Two 175 watt solar panels from Renogy, a Victron 130 MPPT solar charge controller, a Victron Lynx Power In, a Victron Smart Shunt, a 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter, a fuse panel for my 12 volt fuses and 120 volt breakers, as well as two cutoff switches, one for the solar panels and one for the battery and my DIY 230 amp hour lithium battery. Yes, I said DIY battery. By connecting lithium cells together, attaching a Bluetooth battery management system, setting that all up correctly, one can make a lithium battery for a fraction of the cost of buying a pre-made one like a Battleborn. This was done solely as a cost saving measure and I provided links to where I bought my cells from and the exact BMS I used to turn those cells into a battery in the description below the like button. The entire electrical build started with us creating roof mounts for the solar panels out of aluminum tubes. This involved drilling holes using a drill press and attaching bolts to securely mount the solar panels to the roof. Here you can see I'm wearing my safety crocs on the roof of the van and the panels are going in place. Isn't that satisfying? Once they were connected, we could move the temporary setup of the electrical system into the van. Here you can see from left to right, the battery with the BMS, the smart shunt and the switch, the Lynx power in, the 2000 watt inverter, and the solar charge controller. Once it was in, it was time to give the system its first test. Naturally, I fried some chicken. And here I am standing proudly with the system.
Afterwards, we did the wiring. I didn't film this step as we were tediously feeding wire throughout the whole van, but having a full 3D model of the interior really came in clutch and saved us tons of time. By already having planned out exactly where every light, switch, outlet, and appliance would be, we knew exactly where to feed each wire. Here's how it looked after hooking some lights up in it, and a sweet family photo. Then we tackled the skylight. A skylight was something I considered early in the build to be a luxury and not something worth spending large amounts of time, space, or money on. So when I found a good sized skylight that only cost me $180 Canadian, I was convinced to take the plunge and I have not regretted it since. I love the skylight because it's something you always notice when you first enter the van. It's something that stands out and it certainly offers a lovely view of the sky both day and night. However, the nicest thing about the skylight is the amount of sunshine that it lets in. This feature in the van is one that I love in particular. Then we got a very pretty but unseasonal bout of snow in April and it was too serene not to include in this video. The fridge I bought for the van is a 37 quart Aspenora 12 volt fridge. Overall, I'm satisfied with the fridge. It's got a decent capacity and it sips power. It's been sold on on Amazon since I found it, but it's easily available on their website. Is the plastic on the side supposed to come off? Here I am doing my best to show how big it is. Let's talk about insulation. This is a very important step to get right in your build, as it can determine how comfortable you can be in the van when temperatures are at either end of the extreme. I had planned on doing as much as I could uh, inside the van without sacrificing too much space in order to make it as comfortable as possible in the cold Canadian winters. Prior to choosing my insulation methods, I conducted a lot of research. I decided to use XPS for all the major portions of the van, uh, ranging anywhere from one to three and a half inches of it. Can spray foam for the nooks and crannies, and adhesive foam sheets like this to cover all the exposed metal beams. After that, it's simply a matter of filling in the leftover gaps as best you can. I made this sickening picture with all the van's wall dimensions in order to determine how much insulation I would need. And after tallying up all these numbers, I went insulation shopping. With the aid of a foam specific adhesive that did merely adequate work as a glue, we began adhering it to the walls. Then we politely requested for the door panels to come off the doors. Very easy. For the ceiling, I used one inch XPS insulation. But if you look at the roof, it's actually ribbed. So I knew that there would be an air gap between the insulation and the roof at some parts. But there's a type of insulation that works best with an air gap, Reflectix. So each panel had a sheet of Reflectix on the top side, just to get the most out of the ceiling insulation and repel the hot summer heat radiating through the metal roof. Here's what the completed insulation looked like. In between larger projects, we drilled a hole for what would become the bathroom vent. It actually looked really nice. For the flooring, I choose to use sheet vinyl. It's much more reliable and long lasting than the vinyl tiles, while still being waterproof, durable, and it comes in a variety of styles. My dad and I applied it to the floor using 2330 vinyl adhesive, which was pretty easy all things considered, but I would recommend wearing gloves and clothes you don't mind getting strong glue onto. You can see we are using wood to kneel on. This is simply to distribute our weight as to not make any uneven spots in the glue that would show up later as bumps under the floor. The most difficult part of this process was rolling all the excess glue out from underneath the sheet in order to make it all flat. Take your time and it'll turn out well though. Here's what it looks like finished. Also, can't forget those end caps. After all of this preparation, the van was finally ready to receive some walls. We used the thinnest plywood I could find in order to conserve as much lateral space as possible, given the amount of space already being taken up by the insulation. In hindsight, I realized that having as much insulation as possible and then capping it off with a thin piece of plywood was not the best course of action. Because the van's walls are curved, we reasoned that using thin plywood to bend to the curves would be a good use of the available space. 
However, in reality, this only made construction of everything else that needed to be pressed up against the curved walls far more difficult. What the fuck? We put up the walls over the course of a few days, and in between, I used wood filler to bridge the gap between sheets. Another thing that would have been easier if the walls weren't curved, and this ended up looking pretty bad. Thankfully, the paint covers it up well, and the worst parts are covered by things that are against the walls, but this will need improvement someday for sure. Before I even started the van build, I knew what style of ceiling I wanted. A base of plywood painted black with long strips of oiled wood running along it. And the process to make it was pretty simple. Paint some plywood black, oil strips of wood, and then staple the wood strips to the painted wood spaced out evenly. So with some help from my brother and my dad, we were able to assemble the ceiling, and it came out looking like this. We then drilled holes for the puck lights, fan, and skylight, and it was looking like this. Next, we needed to, you know, actually get this thing on the ceiling of the van. And unfortunately, my recording of this step got corrupted, so the internet will never see how hard me, my brother, my dad, and my girlfriend all struggled to get this thing on the ceiling. We worked it out and did it without breaking any bones or losing any limbs, but it was hard. Next time, we're building the ceiling in place. Here's us standing confidently after our accomplishment. Great success. After that, we cut the hole for my water inlet. Really simple. Once you cut one hole in the perfectly good body of your van, you've cut them all. We gave the water system its first official test and only spilt water in the van three times. And then it was time to build the bed frame. Using the 3D model, I knew the exact dimensions and height that it had to be so we could assemble it quickly using some 2x4s and some plywood. With the walls up, we could start painting. We first did a coat of primer and then came back over with three coats of my color of choice. I went for a warm off-white because I didn't like the harsh look of a pure white and I think this color complements the interior really well. Here's what it looked like after the primer went on. I couldn't believe how much it brightened the space. The next day we went back over with the off-white paint and painting was done. I bought a custom cut foam mattress that was too firm and it was time to build and install the bed. Wow, would you look at that? The wolf blanket is necessary before I get comments about it. Thanks so much. That night I had my first sleep in the van and it was great. I woke up and cooked myself scrambled eggs and bacon using the induction stove. It always feels good cooking a meal using solar energy, but this was the first day I got a glimpse of what waking up in my van might be like on the road. In my design, I wanted a way to lounge in front of some kind of screen for days when it's raining or too cold to do anything outside. Plus, I love playing video games and watching videos, so the idea of a way to do that comfortably in the van was on my mind for a while. I didn't want to have a large monitor stashed somewhere because it takes up too much space for how often it would be used, but a projector, now that's something I could get behind. In light of this, the bed needed to be able to hinge somewhere along its base, so we simply cut it down the middle and fitted it with a hinge. We ended up changing the position of the hinge later, but this is what it looked like at the time. Oh, and we also fitted it with an automatic lift. Thanks, Nona. Automatic bed raiser. Old man on the ground. Stolen from Nona's chair. My sink, fridge, and water tank all arrived in the mail. All of the major pieces of my kitchen, as I already had the induction cooktop. So that meant we could begin the kitchen build. I got a 32-gallon freshwater tank that sits over top of the wheel well. It was really expensive for what it is, but the space it saves is priceless. The amount of water it holds is enough to hit my goal of lasting two weeks off-grid without a fill-up. So next, it was time to tackle the kitchen. As you've seen in the model, I had a very particular design for my kitchen. Thin drawer for cutlery and cooking utensils, a thick drawer for pots, pans, and my Instant Pot, and then a drawer for the fridge at the bottom. To the right, a spice cabinet slash pantry, and on the left, the under-sink storage. That was the plan at least. Let's see how well we executed it. After reclaiming some wood, we started with a basic frame. Cut the counter to size and then cut a hole for the sink and the cooktop. Then started to assemble the drawers, which, oh my god, were a pain in the ass. I made a little chair for testing in the meantime. And slowly but surely, the kitchen came together. Look how beautiful she is. 
The finishing touch was the custom cut panel for my bedside charger. The pantry cabinet wasn't exactly to plan and ended up being split into an extra drawer. And here's how the van was looking at this point. Pretty clean if you ask me. We then finalized the plumbing for the kitchen sink, just using a five gallon bucket for my gray tank, with a hole drilled through the floor of the van to dump gray water with the turn of a valve. Very convenient. Here's a few rapid fire things we did next. We made another chair for the booth, then threw up some walls for the bathroom. Naturally took some celebratory pics once the door went on and, uh, oh, it's a little small. We didn't like the placement of the bathroom light, so we moved it, easy peasy. And the basic structure of the bathroom was complete. Built some storage boxes underneath the seats, then started cutting out the cushions for the seats themselves. I bought some fabric, and then my wonderful, talented mother sewed them together for me. Here's our first completed pillow cover. You can tell we were both stoked. At this time, it was now the end of August, and I was able to take the van on its first real long distance trip up past North Bay with my girlfriend Snowy to visit her family. It was a really nice time, and having the van to sleep comfortably in every night was just the cherry on top. On our way back, we stayed at Awenda Provincial Park and had a blast too. Here's the dope ass pasta we made. When I got home, I decided I needed to find a better way of insulating these corners of the van. I ultimately chose cotton batting as my insulator. Now, I can already hear the comments on this. Cotton batting is going to mold in your van. It's not even a good insulator. Havelock wool is way better. And to that last point, I agree. Havelock wool is better. But I didn't have hundreds of dollars to drop on a package that would come from New Zealand. And plus, some insulation is always going to be better than nothing. As far as mold concerns go, I sanitized the areas I put the cotton into and only put it in areas I knew could breathe, reducing the risk of mold. Did it work? We'll have to wait and see. But am I happy that I insulated as much as I could? Yes. Then the long awaited cabinets could finally be assembled. We were pretty happy to be buying wood again, I guess. And we were very satisfied with how the first one turned out. We attached it to the ceiling using threaded hooks that were hooked into the body of the van. We added some black fabric to finish up the back corner and installed it. Here's how it looks shining down into the kitchen and me sitting proudly with it. The doors were installed the next day and it was onto the second cabinet. It had a portion that didn't come as low so that there was more headspace in the dining area. And here's how it looked at night with the undermounted lights shining for the first time in the correct orientation. Okay, so if you've ever used a Max Air Fan, you may have experienced the same frustrations I did. This knob for opening and closing the lid of the fan is extremely annoying. It's clunky, weirdly shaped, and you can't turn it without banging your knuckles against the wall of the frame. So after begging my brother to model a new one for me that would actually be usable, yes, the knob is this complicated inside the shaft, we printed it and it worked perfectly. If you'd also like to get rid of your old terrible knob, I've left a link in the description to our 3D model. And if you don't have a 3D printer, soon we'll be doing sales of pre-printed knobs. The build was almost coming to a close. There were just a few key things left to finish. First, we needed to make a table for the booth that could convert into a couch, which proved to be more difficult than anticipated because we had nothing to mount this table to on the wall. Eventually, we came up with the perfect solution using galvanized steel pipes. In table mode, they fit together to be the perfect height, and to convert to couch mode, they disassemble easily while still being supported. Even though it's made out of plywood, I was really satisfied with how the tabletop turned out. Oh, and also we added gas struts to the cabinets. Very convenient. There's only one thing to do when you finish your table install, and that's eat a good meal off of it. We finished the cushions for the van, and then I went to do a work stay on a farm for a week. It was very beautiful there, but during my time sleeping through negative two degree nights, I realized how desperately this van needed a diesel heater. So that's exactly what we installed. It was pretty simple, but required thorough planning on its placement. Nice! Fun fact, this is the only part of the entire build that didn't have its position pre-planned from the beginning, but I think it turned out alright. A link to this exact heater is also in the description below. Next on the list to do was the toilet. With the structure of the bathroom completed, we needed to assemble the actual toilet box itself. We simply slapped some wood together to make a box, sanded the parts that would be touched, and it was time to assemble the inner workings of the toilet. I chose to go with a DIY composting toilet, as cassette toilets and the like don't eliminate smells and need to be emptied frequently, and a name brand pre-made composting toilet would cost over $1,000. So no thanks, I'll just poop in a bucket. You can see from this picture that the construction is simple. 
The solids go into a 5 gallon bucket that is aligned with a compostable bag, and the liquids are separated by the black attachment and are funneled into a plastic jug. The computer fan on the wall vents the smells to the outside and also works to dry out the poop, eliminating the smell altogether. Remember the vent hole we drilled? This setup cost me less than a tenth of what it costs to buy one pre-made, and I've used it many times without complaint. You don't know the luxury of having your own toilet until you need to go at midnight and it's negative 10 degrees outside. Pure bliss. Here's how the van was looking at this point. Simple yet efficient design, adequate lighting both natural and artificial, a bathroom, sink, bed, and dining area, and overall I was feeling so happy and blessed to have made it this far. One of the big things left that hadn't been checked off yet was the facade or cabinet door for underneath the bed, so we tackled that next. We simply assembled two hinges attached to a 2x4 and a piece of plywood that would serve as the door and then fixed it in place. After some sanding and installing a handle, here's how it looked. And where the diesel heater was situated. The heater is right in the center of the van more or less, so it gives heat to the entire living area very nicely, which we were going to need entering winter. You might have noticed how much raw wood was still left in the van. Though the wood look has some charm of its own, I wanted to paint it to bring some different colors into the mix of the palette. So after much deliberation and advice from a few professionals, I cobbled together my options. It was a really tough choice what to paint what color, but my girlfriend and I were determined to get the painting done right, so we set off. Starting with the primer, we covered every surface that was to be painted. This took us several hours. I didn't film it all because painting is hell, but we eventually got it done. Here's what the primer looked like at this point. Then we painted the rest of the interior. A pale green on the upper cabinets, platinum gray for the lower cabinets, light blue gray for the inside of the bathroom, and the warm off-white of the walls for the bases of the chairs and the facade. How's it look with all the cushions and bedding back in? After painting was completed, I wanted to add extra insurance to my electrical system during the winter. Lithium batteries should not be charged in below zero temperatures, and I've set my BMS to automatically refuse input amperage when the thermometer reads anything below zero. While this does a good job protecting the batteries, it limits the situations in which the batteries themselves can be charged. So, I hooked up 420 watt resistive heat pads to the 12 volt thermostatic switch. The thermostat senses when the temperature reaches zero and turns on the heat pads to warm the battery until it reads a temperature of five degrees. Simple and effective. And just like that, we're caught up to present day. While there are still some things I like to get done in this build, namely window frames, better headlights, cover-ups for the wall joints, and a charger that runs off the van's alternator, it's completely usable in this state, so I'm calling it here for the build video. Now the build is complete and all of the hard work can begin to pay off. I want to express my gratitude to everyone who helped me with the build, even those who didn't appear in this video. My dad, my brother John, my girlfriend Snowy, my mom, my cousin Matthew, and many others. Without you, I really couldn't have done it. I'd also like to thank you, the viewer, for watching this video all the way to this point. If you enjoyed watching the construction of this van and would like to see a full tour, check out this video here. Or if you'd like to learn more about why I decided to live in a van, click here. Finally, if you like me and want to follow along with my journey, hit subscribe and I'll see you soon for another video. Bye.